Hey, Neil Patterson here. For only $5 a month, you can be supporting your boy, me. If you enjoy my stupid videos, if you enjoy my little comedy skits, if you enjoy my podcast, this is the best way. For only $5 a month, check out my Patreon, patreon.com backslash Neil P. Neil P., thank you in advance for getting me through 2021 and beyond. Hello, and welcome to the 75th episode of my podcast, Subcast. Yo, my name is Neil Patterson. I'm a dude. Thank you for tuning in. This is the silver anniversary of the show, which I started in 2019. I had wax on my podcast in the year 2019, and I went over to his place when I was living in California, and I sweat a lot, and I was nervous, and I didn't know what was going on, but I was very new to this. 75 episodes in, I'm getting more better. Could I get more better? I could possibly become the most bestest. I'm going to quit blabbing. Let's get the fuck into it. We got Wax and Herbal Tea, the Wonder Twins from Maryland via Califlorida. Two twin brothers that make sick-ass music that I met back in the year 2003. Just a reminder to like, comment, and subscribe. If you comment, that helps what is called the algorithm. The video will perform more better. And let's perform in the comments and let's engage with the content. Also, I do have a Patreon, so if you enjoy this content, please sign up for the Patreon and help a dude like me survive in this harsh winter landscape. Let's get into the episode. We have Wax and and herbal tea the 75th episode of subcast i am neil p let's get it My name is Neil Patterson. I'm a dude. And this is the Silver Anniversary episode 75 of my stupid podcast, which is entitled Subcast, as in What's Up Cast. We combine the two. It's a podcast, What's Up? And I'm here with my friends, Wax and Herbal Tea, who are twin brothers and dudes that make stuff and music. And uh, I've known them for quite a long time. Met them in Detroit, Michigan at the shelter in the year 2003, which is now approaching... A long fucking time ago. So, hey, dudes. Welcome to the program. Hello. I'm not looking, What's up, Neil? I'm not looking directly at you, but I am looking at a monitor directly at you. So, Cool. Yes. And uh, I have... I don't know. We, we haven't done like a, a together thing in a while, so I apologize if we step on each other's words. Step on each other. I figure... <laughs> I, have, I have questions about being twins. Identical twins, right? Yeah. Do you, do y'all feel pain if the other feels pain? Is like that thing from GI Joe? Is that real? Um, the truth about that is, is I've thought in the past, like, oh, I feel some kind of intuition that my brother is in trouble, and I'll call him. And I'll be like, dude, are, are you okay? And he's like, yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> I've only I've only had false uh, intuition with like something's wrong with my twin brother. Shit. So I don't know. Maybe some other people do have that. We have a th we have the thing where, like, if you were to ask a question, we might we might say the exact same thing at the exact same time, just randomly. But we but the feel each other's pain. I, I don't I don't think there is that. Or even without a question, like we'll just be like sitting in silence and then say the exact same thing. That's like a totally random off the, off any subject we've been talking about, just out of the blue. Like seriously, like you're being serious right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. That is cool. Yeah, and so, yeah, because I, there's that, the, the twins that are on G.I. Joe, they're part of Cobra, and they have some sort of, like, they feel each other's pain. I don't remember. I just remember when I was a little kid, I'd be like, is, is that, do twins do that? Is that a thing? I guess not. But mm -hmm. but the completing sentences and thinking same thoughts. So do you, do you think y'all possess, like, I mean, this, it's, similar dna is it exact dna like what what do you think the the completing of thoughts and that type of stuff comes from well the the uh it's kind of it's kind of weird because we, we you know we don't have we're not the same height we're not the same we've always been a little bit different in size and whatnot but identical twins have the exact same dna exactly the same 100%. oh wow okay dna yeah so i actually just like uh you know they, they have studies where twins were separated at birth for whatever reason and like 
you know, what kind of shit you're, you're, you retain from, you know, what kind of shit's nature and what kind of shit's nurture. And we have kind of double that because we're also adopted. So yeah. we have like a double, a double dose of like what's nature and what's nurture. Plus he has kids that are totally different from each other. And that we can kind of see firsthand as any parent would that has a brother, two siblings that aren't alike. Like some shit is just, they're just born that way. You know what I mean? But uh, we kind of have like a, an interesting peek at, because we now, not only are we adopted, but a few years ago, we, now we actually know our birth parents as well as the parents that raised us. You know what I mean? So we got a pretty unique situation. How did that go down? Good. Oh, I mean, how it went, it went well. It yeah. Went like well. How, how did next it, topic? How did, no, yeah. <laughs> it was good. I, I was the one that, so basically like, um, I, uh, was about to have a kid and I guess I felt an innate need to just, I don't know. I ne- I just decided to reach out to, uh, my biological mother. I had some information on her. I had, I had her name and I had, I knew the high school she went to and it took me about 10 seconds to find her. I just put that in Google and there she, there was her Facebook and I Facebook messaged her. So it was that simple. Whoa. What was the, what was her initial reaction? Was she like, Hey, uh, <laughs> no, nah, she was like, oh, she was like, hey, no, I, I, actual question. Serious question. What was her? It, uh, I don't remember exactly, but she was pretty shocked. You know, it was like out of the blue. You know, she knew who I was immediately. And, um, you know, I think she went through and looked at all my pictures. And I think it was like very, you know, it was a big deal for at her and me, you know what I mean? So um, then we just started emailing back and forth and uh, kept in touch, met each other. And that was uh, like 10 years ago. And we've been in touch. And she actually was the one that got in touch with our biological father, who was not, it wasn't like they were like some couple or anything. Yeah. More of a short, short term situation. Right. My, uh, I have a nephew and actually he's adopted. So there are biological parents that aren't in any sort of contact with him. And he was raised by my brother and my ex, now ex sister-in-law. And yeah, it would be, it's, it's wild to think that my nephew might be a certain age as an adult and, and connect, you know? Mm-hmm. I think there's something to do with the actual adoption agency where it's, that's a no, no at this point. I think it is like that. You're not supposed to do that. You're not, you're not supposed to be able to reach out. And I think there's people have trouble with it. And I think every situation is different. Like what you said, like it's legally, it's different. All Like, you know, most, most adopted kids these days, I think, I, I don't know the statistics, but a lot of them are from other countries. It's not as much adoption from like what was more common when we were adopted was the kids were um, Catholic usually, and the Catholic church would like kind of be the impetus to like get the, the unmarried mother to, to choose adoption as opposed to like abortion or raising uh. kids or whatever. And that's not as common. It's a lot more frowned upon. And um, now it's not as common to adopt kids here. And it's more like kids from other countries or whatever. And there's it's more difficult everywhere. too. It's more difficult. It's more expensive. I mean, my mom said that it, uh, when she adopted us, she, oh, my sister is adopted too, but uh, it was like 400 bucks or something like that. Now it's like 50 grand and you have to go through this whole process, which is kind of crazy because anybody can have a kid the regular way. You know? Yeah, it was wild. They came to my brother's house and they did like a, a, a life study. They had like people like spying on them and being like, "What? Well, how, do, how does this couple operate? And then they had to get like a loan off of uh, her parents. And I think my dad, when he was alive, he threw down... Um, which was weird because my brother wasn't talking to my dad, but my dad just like cut him a big check and was like, just threw down is like, Hey, I know we don't talk, but let me help you buy this kid. It was wild. <laughs> How old <laughs> is that kid now? He's eight. He just turned eight. And, and it is, and it's wild because he's, you know, he's having kind of a rough time. I think he knows he's adopted. And I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's I, better that he knows than if they tell him when he's older, it's better that he knows. That yeah. Well, you know, yeah, we knew we knew from a young age, like we knew that we were adopted before we knew what adopted even means. You know what I mean? So right. like, even when we were like little, little 
tykes we knew that that we were i think we didn't realize that it was more like as rare that it was that it was so we probably thought that half kids were and half the kids weren't you know right i was when i was on the playground i was saying the word gay a lot before i knew what it meant too so that was the thing <laughs> Yeah, even same. Is, yeah, because we're like the same age ish, right? I was born in eighty one. Y'all are like a little bit older yeah. than me. Yeah, yeah, seventy nine. Same generation, dude. So we, so so yeah. I mean, of, of course, you know the uh, the history of the word gay and the changing of the word gay, and uh, you know, it probably was always bad, but it was looked at in a whole different way. And then even before our time, the word gay had a whole whole different meaning when it was just if you're happy and gay and ju- just like your song, yeah. You know? Well, and I was listening to uh, the song "God Damn, What Happened to Pam" off the Grizzly season, and you say everybody frolic and be happy and gay. That was yes. We yeah. just I was just doing a few shows. We were down in Ohio, and we I listened to it because um I, I'm an Apple Music guy now, which is weird. I I made the jump from Spotify, and and turns out that you can upload your entire Apple Music catalog, which mine has all these like really obscure local bands. And then it's got like o- like older stuff that isn't even on Apple Music. And you can upload it all to a cloud and then you could access it on your phone at any time. So I'm like, I'm like listening to these, all these bands from like 03, 02. Um, but McGregor and Wax and Herbal Tea are on Apple Music. But Nice. But the band Anal Pudding from Buffalo, New York is <laughs> not. So yeah. But yeah, uh, I have the the CD. I have a box of CDs that has like all the bands that we played with during that era, you know, just like random local bands from anywhere on the East Coast or Midwest. And uh, I think very few of those are available. I don't know. Anal Pudding, though. Anal Pudding is like? some classic stuff. They have a song. called mm. They have a song called Avril Lavigne, Be My Latrine. And it's a classic. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, I thought I was like, a, I had, I said rage against the, the latrine one time and I thought I was being original, but literally I knew anal pudding was way before me. Yeah. Anal pudding has a song called, can I masturbate in your car? Anal pudding has a song called tripping on my turds. It's, you know, mostly like scatological references. Um, mm. yeah. What's the sound like? Uh, it's like funky kind of, boom, but um, most of the people in the band, are is a live recording that we got back in 05 and everyone's like on mushrooms and and it, and the music is pretty terribly executed but but me and my old bass player Harry Bob would just drive around and giggle at all the jokes because Oh so you're so you're record it's a live recording it's not an album album It's a live album it was recorded at some like backyard party I miss live albums man you don't see that as much anymore Yeah I don't know I mean, I don't know the last the last live album I listened to was Anal Pudding and that was this weekend when I was driving around Ohio. Damn. A lot of it used to kind of be you. That was like, as a band, you always had a live album. You had like put out two albums and put out a live album. And like, that was just standard. It's, it was different. I think the thing with live albums is like back in that, back in that time, you just wanted to have, because the only way that a motherfucker could hear your music is if you had the CD, you can't yeah. just put out songs and people go get like you needed to give somebody something. So like you'd ha- like if you if all you had was like a recording of your last show here, take it, take this, take that, whatever you can. Because yeah. just like your just like your anal pudding CD, it's not on, <laughs> spot, it's not on Spotify or whatever. You got to have a fucking CD. Yeah. Well, now the live recording would be a YouTube show, your show, like the whole show on YouTube. As exactly. Well, you yeah. just send the link right. as opposed yeah. to an album. Yeah, because we're old. But let, let's go back to when y'all were children. When did when did you dudes start playing musical instruments or or start making mouth sounds? Was that something that just you were compelled to do at a very young age? I mean, I, I remember that I remember that I started taking guitar. I got a guitar for Christmas from my my uncle. Well, you know, uh, my uncle John, my godfather. He's like we call him uncle. It wasn't actually my blood uncle, but in sixth grade, I got a guitar. Same. It was like a, 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 it was an acoustic guitar and it was like classical guitar. And like, I remember it was really hard to play. Like the action was super high and I'm in sixth grade. You know what I'm saying? It was really hard to play, but I started, I took lessons in middle school. And by the end of middle school, I was in the middle school jazz band. I do remember that. Uh, and then um, Chris was playing before I was, he was playing drums before I was. And then so some other neighborhood kids did, but we probably started playing, play, you know how it is, man. It's like, you know, you start pretty young and it's just kind of like, you just evolve into it. We watched a shit load of MTV. Same. A shit load. Like, Same, dude. You ever think, Neil, Neil, you ever think about how much that affected your life? 
I think about it all the time. I was just having a conversation uh, about it on an episode of this podcast, how my older sister would commandeer the television and she was bigger than us. So she would take the remote control and she would physically beat us if we tried to take the remote from her and watch Nickelodeon or something. So we were children of MTV just by default because she would beat the shit out of us, take the remote, and then we were forced to watch Madonna and Bon Jovi. And we were for but it's one of those things that I look back at, I really enjoyed it. It was formative, you know? And we MTV- had a sim- really similar experience. Very honestly. similar, yeah. Yeah, yeah MTV- Except we had we had two of us so we could combine against <laughs> our sister. And our our older sister liked loved hair metal. Yeah. And that whole era was her favorite band was Slaughter. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, band. Up all night, sleep all day. She loved all that. She shit. also liked Nelson. Do you remember Nelson? Oh, of course. Yeah, she loved Nelson. Yeah. So- but, uh, but, yeah but we loved it. We loved that shit, too. And we were I remember specifically like my dad watches a lot of TV to this day. My dad's kind of a couch potato. So we were like the first people in our neighborhood, the first family to get cable. I remember when we got cable and turning on. Uh, when we turned on MTV, I, I like I remember, I remember video too. video killed the radio star and and Lucky Star Lucky by Star Madonna, by Madonna was the one being that I remember. little 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 kid and uh, not even really realizing it how, at the time how much that shit would affect my entire life. Like these signals that were put into my head is like, oh, that's cool. Try to do that. And by, it's funny, like I, all I wanted to do was be on MTV and like. There was a couple of times where I was on MTV and by the time I got on MTV, it's like, who gives a shit about being on MTV? You know what I'm saying? Like, that's wild, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I'm, t- I, I don't, all I remember, like it's vague memories. I don't remember the first time I watched it, but I remember when the Guns N' Roses, uh, when it was Appetite, I think it was 88. I just remember watching the Welcome to the Jungle video and being like, is that a guy or a girl? I didn't know what it was. It seemed really, oh, like, yeah. and it seemed really dangerous. And I'm just like, I'm like, this is crazy. And then we, we were one of those families that had HBO. Like my parents sprang for HBO. So we had cable, but we had HBO. So, so like early in the morning or late at night, I would go down in the basement and I watch movies that I'm not supposed to watch. And one of them, what was the movie where, it, it it wasn't stand and deliver, but it was um was it stand by me? Whereas Morgan Freeman takes over the the high school in the very oh uh, yeah in the very is it Morgan Freeman? It was in the that's ver- not that's not stand by no, me. No, it's not. It's neither of those. But there's uh I don't know that it was Morgan Freeman either. What the fuck? Was I think that there movie? was several. There was several of those at the time in that general like eighties nineties where there's like a troubled high school. It was eighties. Someone someone comes in and like. That was, there was like various I, movies I don't, of that. Nature. I think there was one with Morgan Freeman, though. Was it? I think there was one with Morgan Freeman. But Stand by Me had like Corey Feldman. Yeah, that was kid. They Find a Dead Body. Uh, okay, Stand yeah. and Deliver must have been it. I'd no, have Stand and Deliver was Edward James almost teaching Lou Diamond Phillips how to do trigonometry or some shit. Um, now the, the, I fucking don't remember what this movie is called. But the opening they were learning tri- they were learning trigonometry because they all had three names: Edward James almost and Lou Diamond Phillips. So it was a triangle. <laughs> Of Lou Diamond and Phillips and Edward James and Almost. <laughs> I mean, that's why Edward James almost had to teach them trigonometry so they could understand their name and what. Yeah, right. I think the soundtrack was by John Cougar Mellencamp. Yeah, yeah there you go. Too. Lou Diamond Phillips kept, kept getting it close to the right answer and, and he was getting it like Edward James almost. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry, dude. Yeah, I go for I go for jokes that aren't there sometimes. The I dad apologize. jokes are on point today, but. But yeah, all I remember is the opening scene of this movie. It's this, it's this troubled high school, and Welcome to the Jungle is playing in the soundtrack, and you you actually see this kid smashing the teacher's head against the cafeteria floor. It was like it was jarring, and I remember being I remember associating Guns and Roses and that song with violence in my brain, and then immediately my brain is like, "That's cool. I want more of this." And then that was kind of when I began to go down the rock and roll rabbit hole and then public enemy anthrax happened. And then it's, it was all just, you know, then I got into punk rock. It was, it was all downhill after that, but yeah, MTV highly, I always, highly I always think about that, dude. Like I always think about how that, like, I mean, it, it, it was further enhanced by like skateboarding culture and punk rock and shit, but like that, that like guns and roses and early hip hop, like and uh, NWA, of course, like that all led me to believe that like, delinquency was awesome yeah like being a like just just you know i mean it is to a degree it is to a degree <laughs> is all, you know what i'm saying but like it is it dude. led me to it led me to believe that people i don't know 
Yeah. All that's like, once, once you go down the rabbit hole and you like, it was definitely like we would, we skateboarded in the back of all the magazines that'd just be like ads for all like punk bands and you could order their albums or whatever. And I didn't even know half the time. I didn't know who the, like, no matter, I knew the list of bands, even if I didn't know what their songs were. Yeah. And then you'd see like, if you saw like, or heard like black flag or something, it's just like, I want to listen to this and just go crazy and fucking break stuff or like, just be a delinquent. And yeah. That was like what all that, <laughs> all that, uh, but it, you know, but it has no influence on the youth. Totally. Uh, <laughs> I think it did though. That Well, what was wild to me is when I was in middle school and doggy style came out, Snoop Dogg doggy style. And that shit was the coolest shit. It, it was like, it was unreal how cool it was. And when we all got the CD, we didn't even know what the fuck they were talking about. And I, I talked to my buddy Norwood about this. It, like all that talk about, I didn't know what fucking weed was. I didn't know what chronic was. I, you know, I didn't know what sex was, but, but I was listening to this shit and I was like, yeah, talking about rubbers. I didn't know what a rubber was. I didn't see a condom in like, I saw like a used condom at the baseball field. When I was in middle school, we used to like go set off firecrackers with my friends. And I saw this thing. I didn't know what it was. I didn't, my dad didn't sit me down and tell me about that shit. I learned all that shit from porn in high school, late middle school. I don't think I ever got to talk like that either. I was t- t- talking to my girl about that. And she was saying, talking about what, how, how that worked in her family. I was like, I don't think that I ever got a uh, talk like that. And it's funny. Cause yeah, I remember listening to easy E and NWA and they were, if you listen, it's, it's insane. Like, it's almost like a, it's not reality at all. How they talk. <laughs> they, I mean, he talks about, he, he threw the bitch across and knocked his old ass out. He actually had a bitch. <laughs> I, 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 I can't remember the, 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 the What's that? The, uh, I can't remember, but there's there's like, some the, stuff that's it's really it's bad. It's just crazy. Some it's, of the Easy E stuff. There's one I'm thinking of. I don't even want to bring it up. Where he's like talking about robbing the bank and shooting the guy. And I do remember. I learned what the word pussy was from that. From uh, then I take the other pussy, put it in the freezer, freezer, so I could always have my own house keys. What does that even mean? He said he put, <laughs> put the pussy in the freezer so he can always have his own hoe skeezer. That's what he said, I believe. Then I'll take the other pussy yeah. and put it in the How do you put a pussy in the freezer and save it? Then I'll like, let the Alpine day. play, right? And yeah, I don't know. But to this Bumping day, it shit on WA. That is wild. Yeah. and But I, I don't think that the... I was being facetious when I said it didn't have effect on the youth. I mean, you'd like to oh, say... Yeah. And people make the argument like it's just free expression. That's all music. But like, you know... Kids, kids want to smoke blunts and drink for, or in the nineties, you want to drink forties and smoke blunts. You want to like go crazy or like, you know, songs like breaking the law or whatever you're into. Like it, it does have some type of effect. I remember driving around with my buddy, listening to the first bone thugs and harmony album Hell yeah. and my, my friends Ford Festiva. Nice. And like that shit was super, like really dope, very violent. And like, you just felt like it just made you feel, you know, like, uh, yeah, man, fuck anybody that tries to fuck with us. <laughs> yeah, there was an allure to it. And, and dude, it's the 30th anniversary of the first, uh, not the first White Zombie album, but the big White Zombie album that broke on Beavis and Butthead. And, I, and yeah, th- there is just all like weird cartoon zombie boobs. And it, to say that didn't have an effect on me, it would would be silly. Like, of course it had an effect. It was highly influential. All that shit was highly influential. Like Snoop Dogg made you want to smoke weed. I didn't even know what weed was, but I knew as soon as I had the opportunity, I tried it. And it was freshman year of high school. I'm like, yo, I, I want this. I want to be cool. Like the cool kids yeah. are smoking weed. I remember Cypress Hill was big on big for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cypress Hill really made you want to smoke weed. Cause the music was so awesome. It's like, yeah, if you, if you smoke weed, you'll like it even more, you know? Yeah. And all the psychedelic era of like, like when you go back and you get into Hendrix and anything from, from, it makes you want to do acid. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. The, the Doors movie with Val Kilmer. You ever seen that? The Oliver Stone yeah, one? Yeah, yeah. 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 That used to be my pregame when I used to fucking be a big time shitty alcoholic, like a shit the bad alcoholic. I would watch the Doors movie and be like, yeah, I want to be a misunderstood fucking rock and roll drunken poet dead on a toilet kind of thing and uh i thought it was cool it was it's really weird in retrospect because i haven't drank in a while like looking at it and being like i wanted to emulate that and then you come to find 
that the members of the Doors were super pissed off at Oliver Stone because they thought it depicted Jim Morrison in an untrue light. I guess he if was- you watch it, if you watch it now, he's kind of a corny dude. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> Like, whoa, are you so are you so mystic, dude? Whoa. Yeah, like Yeah, he was a fucking shaman. I well, my right. my girlfriend jokes because there's this one scene where he just like he just like makes his way into Meg Ryan's like upstairs apartment. He kind of like glides in and he's like, I want to tell you some poetry. And and like nowadays, a woman would be like, get the fuck out of my house. You yeah, know? Yeah. yeah. It just seems a little unbelievable. But, you know, I fucking love their music, though, man. God yeah. Damn. That's some good. That's some good um, touring music. L.A. Woman and shit. Ugh, that's so good. Yeah. Carry me caravan. Take me away. That's good. <laughs> good stuff so what's are y'all working on new music yeah i'm always working on music man i'm always working and now i live in san diego where uh chris lives so um we we working on more stuff together than we used to because i used to live in los angeles where, where he lives here in san diego yeah. so we we're a few hours apart but uh now we like you know like tonight, for example, tonight he's getting out of his house away from his family. And he has like one night a week where he he's like, I do creative night tonight. <laughs> so he comes he comes here and we make beats or or sometimes we sometimes it feels more like, OK, let's work on getting something done. And sometimes we kind of just jam, you know what I mean? Which is cool. Like it's you get back to the essence of why you started doing this shit in the first place, you know, just straight up like let's let's get let's fucking get out of our heads and into the vibe. You know what I mean? I think you got a line that talks about music being part of a to-do list, Mike. Yep. Yeah, and I think it loses some of its uh, magic when you're working on completing a task as opposed to just fucking around with the people you like and letting shit kind of flow out of you, you know? Yeah, I agree. But it's it's like it's hard not to eventually kind of, you know, if you got to finish a song, you got to finish a song. That's it's true. Got, it's something you have to do, you know what I mean? Unfortunately. It is like that. Unless you just were like totally like I do everything improv in the moment. I don't even play songs that already exist. You know what I mean? I want to be in a band like that. Well, I just remembered I would be jamming with the dudes in the garage and we'd come up with a part and then we'd build on that part and yada yada. It didn't it wasn't like we have to finish this, but we okay. knew it was going to be finished at some point because, you know. It, but but it was like a natural evolution. We didn't have to like really push it. I remember th- we we had a schedule to make this album one time, and we were we had to push it. We were just like, oh, we need this much material by this date, and and that was it. Felt a little rushed, you know. How are you feeling about it now these days? Are you are you uh, are you more like uh, to do listy? Are you trying? How do you, how do you feel about music now? You. Oh man. Um, that's a good question, dude. I'm I, I'm kind of took a step back a little bit from I did an album in 2018, which is crazy because I feel like that's the new album, but it was fucking four years ago. That's and that's what's that's nuts because I, I put a lot of effort into that, and then I went on a tour, and like two days into the tour, we all fucking got arrested, and the tour was really stressful because of that. I had to bail people out of jail. Like we all, it was bad, and. uh and yeah, after that, I was just like, fuck this. I'm going to do other things. But then, you know, music crept back and I started doing shows again. And then the pandemic hit and then I started streaming a lot. Um, it feels more, it feels less like I'm trying to make something concrete and, and more like I'm just doing it when I enjoy it. I did put out a single last year. I don't fucking know, man. My mental health took a big hit during the pandemic I, at first i was like fuck this i don't need concerts anymore and then i realized that there was a big part of my life and then we came out to michigan and that was an adjustment when y'all go home it feels different doesn't it hmm. it definitely feels at the longer you're away it feels more like it's like you're an outsider like foreign for sure yeah yeah it like people like ask weird. you where you're from i remember yeah. last time we went someone was like i was at the local water park with my kids yeah and the lady on the slide was like where are you guys from? Y'all ain't from around like, here, are you? Yeah, yeah. I was, I was like, <laughs> yeah, I'm from yeah. here. But uh, you don't feel like it. You just kind of grow. I, I don't know. You just kind of, I don't know if it's the environment here that I've adapted to because I, I haven't noticed it. I guess yeah. it's a slow process. You know, everybody seems so, when I go to where I'm from in Maryland, everybody seems so Marylandy. you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, Maryland. I can't say. 
I can't say anything. I'm just hey man. I feel when bad. I these, I, when I get any of you guys, Italy cats seem Italian. Yeah. <laughs> I was extra Marilyn-y, a big big time. Everybody just sounds like they're from home Maryland Crab. It just sounds different, man. That people I don't know. I feel like more of an outsider as opposed to someone who grew up there. Yeah, I don't feel like I have any home because I came back here and what's wild is when I was out in LA, I was out there like for about five years and then I came back here and it it, it just seems sad, man. You don't see the sun for like days at a time, like sometimes a week at a time. And I and, and what's weird is I didn't feel like that much time went by, but I came back and everyone's like, they look different. They're sadder. They're drunker. Uh, certain like homies that I knew have like sexual assault claims against them and all. It was, it was just a, it's, it, it was like really heavy, a lot of drug use and overdoses and stuff. People, you know, like yeah. addicted to drugs or have overdosed and stuff like that. I, I see that a lot more with people that are from where I'm from then out. I mean, maybe it's just the people I know out here, but I don't really think I know anyone with like major drug issues or like what you're saying, like getting in trouble. I, I don't know. Yeah. It's wild. And, and most- I know, I know people getting in trouble out here too. I, right. You know what? I, I, I do I, I too. I don't, no. I don't find that, that different, but I do, I do, I do find that the people that I grew up with that are still in Maryland, definitely like the whole cult, the whole culture is alcohol. I haven't drank in yeah. a few years now too. The whole, the whole, the whole culture is alcohol, and especially compared to Los Angeles and the people that I was kicking with up there. Everybody there has like a dream, or like they 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 trying to do something. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like most, at least most, not everybody in Los Angeles, but most of the people that I was kicking it with, because most I met most people that I was kicking it with through work. You know what I mean? Whereas back there, I mean, people are still, you know, people. I would. The, I would. People are on their third. People are on their third marriage, and like you knew the people from their first marriage and their second. Like everybody knows each other. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, it's like know. small town vibes. You can, you can fucking erase this whole section of this podcast. It's boring. I don't know. I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. I don't think it's boring at all. That's- but it's everywhere, dude. It's not just yeah. America. Every country I go to, the big, the big. It's like you could think if any, like pretty much any race you can think of. The stereotype is that they drink a lot. That's funny. You know, be like, if you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, Irish. Oh, oh, shit. Italian. You must drink a lot of wine. Oh, Mexico <laughs> tequila, huh? Whatever. Like, it's every fucking culture, the thing yep. is that they get their drunks. Koreans. Yeah. Mexicans. Irish. Every, yeah, everybody. Yeah. So what? what is this pain we're all trying to escape from? Or is it just like, do you think it's just a customary social thing? It's just something that has been embedded into us since, I mean, yeah, for thousands and thousands of years it's embedded in, into us to want to get high i mean what's an what is an orgasm you know what i'm saying the way that we recreate is by these little we're trying to get high we're trying to basically like an orgasm is not that different from a nitrous balloon if you think about like the actual like <laughs> like the, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's embedded into us to to be trying to get high that makes a lot of sense yeah because there's dopamine receptors and whatnot that I mean, same thing with sugar. They say that sugar, yeah. it, yep. it ignites the dopamine receptors in your brain uh, very similarly to cocaine. And that's why every, that's why they put sugar in everything because they know the entire fucking universe is addicted to sugar and you're going to go to the gas station and you're going to buy sugar everything and uh, you're going to keep buying it because you're addicted to it. Just what like, are you addicted to? What, Neil, what are you addicted to now that you still do? Caffeine. Caffeine. And, so coffee, coffee every morning? Uh... Like I work out a bunch now, so I'm kind of like drink these energy drinks, but the, it's not like a monster. It's the, they sell it at the health food store. So, so yeah, stronger than coffee. I'm, I'm ridiculously addicted to caffeine. It's bad. I crash like during the day. I, I, I'm, I wake up super fucking early and I, I don't know. I, I don't do over the recommended adult allotment of caffeine, but it, if you look it up, it's pretty high. It's 400 milligrams. Sometimes I go. How much, how much is a cup of coffee? Well, Seventy-five I know, milligrams. I don't know. So let's do the math. I've right never, now. I've never thought about caffeine no, in terms of milligrams in my life. That's interesting. Oh, I'm weird. I'm weirdly methodical with things. I mean, a, a right. cup of coffee also could be a, a mug, a large. I mean, that's. I'm sure that varies extremely. It's uh, one shot of espresso from Starbucks is 75 milligrams of caffeine. So if you get an americano, that's two shots of espresso. That's 150 milligrams of caffeine. So I'm drinking. Two and a half Americanos, basically. Yeah, 
But still, the thing is, that's a lot. That's a fucking lot. Yeah. The, the thing is, well, I have a tolerance. I, f- now. I feel like I hit that. Uh, I, I think I hit that every day almost. You drink espresso? Yeah. You drink, yeah, yeah. But, yeah so you yeah. put what, two shots in each one? Probably. I drink. Yeah, I'm probably about that 400 if I had to guess. I'd, I'd have to do the math too. But yeah, but he's working out. I'm not. What they say is that caffeine addiction works in a way where your baseline dips. And pretty much what the caffeine does is it brings you back to the energy level where you normally would be if you didn't have caffeine at all. So it doesn't actually give you energy. It brings you back to a fucking baseline and kind of depletes your adrenal glands. It's it's bad. But I but I go. That's like that's like that's like nicotine. People smoke a cigarette to get rid of anxiety, but it's anxiety that was caused by the addiction to nicotine. It wouldn't have been there otherwise. You Correct. Know what I mean? And it, and nicotine doesn't even really get you high. It just, if anything, it just makes your hands smell. Yo, you you quit smoking, right, Mike? Yeah, but I've but I I did, but I've I've struggled with it for years. It's so it's so difficult. Yeah. Yeah, my mom's been smoking since she was 15 years old, and she's about to turn 74. So you do the math. You know, but the, and it's like there's always. There's always, you know, like, you know, when they show like the oldest person in the world, they're always like, the yeah. is, I smoke cools, you know, there's yeah. always like these except exceptions to the yeah. rule that like, kind of like make it through the, the fire, so to speak, you know what I mean? But they, you can't interview somebody who died of lung cancer at 40. The, and and it's the shitty thing about smoking related diseases, especially if you get it when you're younger is like, if I, like, if I told somebody, like, yeah, I got lung cancer, I'd be like, well, you were smoking said it on the box it's not like it's not like fucking getting breast cancer or like some weird stomach cancer where it wasn't your fault it's your fucking fault it's your own fault you know what i mean it's so not your you, fault only so much sympathy you can ex- you can expect you know well and bill hicks the comedian will bring up the like he has a bit where he talks about the long distance runner that just killed Very over. familiar with that bit yep yeah he killed over of a heart attack and he was in prime health. He used to run like 18 miles a day and yada, yada. So I, I think ultimately, I mean, look at Lemmy, the dude from Motorhead. He was fucking drinking a fifth of Jack Daniels and smoking cigarettes all. And he lived to be like, I don't know, was he in his seventies or close to 80? Yeah. Dude? He was did old. you see the documentary? No, I didn't. It, and, and he also did meth, by the way, he was also a meth user, but if you Neil, like everybody, I, I remember talking about that doc, the Lemmy documentary with people and they're like, yeah, he's such a badass. But if you watch the documentary, especially if you have a problem with alcohol and understand how things are, yeah. you won't say that he's a badass. It's fucking his life is fucking sad as shit. In my in my opinion, after watching that documentary about Lemmy, I, I thought his life was fucking sad. What about it? Because uh, I haven't seen it. Just like what specifically? He's to, to me, he's like a dude. He's a dude that's stuck in his own character. He like, he's like Uh, playing, he's like playing the role that he can't get away from. It's like a professional wrestler. Who's like, he's like, Oh, but my fucking back is fucked up. I can't, I have to do, I still have to jump off the top rope. Like he's doing, he's the drinking and all that shit, hanging out at the bar and like, yeah, uh, like, I think he's like deep, like inside, he's not really trying to be that guy. uh, You know what I'm saying? That's what I gathered from it. You know what I'm saying? And I know that, alcohol makes you depressed and he seemed depressed to me even if he doesn't tr- even on the outside he's fucking tough guy mcgee you know but that's just what i gathered from it yo honestly if i was the character i was when i was drinking like when i met y'all in 03 if i was that dude i would be dead like because you definitely would be dead because yo yeah. that dude is too much and and that dude like i you know it was fun for a minute but it got to the point where it's it stops being fun. It starts being really sad, like when you're fucking pissing the bed and shit. I don't know. It's it's not cool. It's not rock and roll. It's actually sad. I think. But I I I understand that. But and it's interesting because when I first met you, I thought that was awesome. I was a different. <laughs> I, I I was at a different point in my life. I was we the McGregor. We were on some like let's not give a fuck about anything and just drink until we die. You know I think that's saying? why we got we, along. We were like that. Yeah. 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 Because when we met y'all, it was, well, first of all, let me tell the story real quick. It, it was 2003. We were opening for two skinny J's. I'm going to make this quick. And uh, we're like super stoked because we got the direct support slot for two skinny J's. Two skinny J's brings an opening band. The opening band is McGregor. I'm angry because I wanted that slot. But then McGregor plays. And as they're playing, it's the dopest shit. 
my girlfriend at the time turns around, looks at me and says, this music makes me want to fuck. And then y'all did. <laughs> yes, that's the story. And then y'all did your, uh, your like acapella, did it, did it, did it, where you're like trading off raps. I don't know exactly what song that was, but you did that and we were just floored and that we wanted to like be y'all's best friend. And uh, then you invited us out to Baltimore. We played in Cleveland at Peabody's. And I remember we stayed at, it was some snowy person's house in the whole, like both bands stayed at this apartment. And it was, it was in Ohio. It was in Ohio and it was snow on the ground. And Mike, Mike Gutierrez, was that the, Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, Mike G, yeah. Yeah, Mike G was like pissing in the snow and like writing his name with piss. And uh, Fraz was like, I don't know. Like Mike was passed out in the other room, but snoring really loud. It was like reverberating the whole house, and 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 Fraz and I were like being bros and just drinking a lot of whiskey. And that's that's basically what I remember. Yeah, yeah I remember that. It was really, really fucking cold in the house. It was like, it was like snowing outside, and like you know we're partying, so so we just leave the doors and windows open, and then you wake up and you're like. You know what I mean? That I think Frazier like took his shirt off, probably. Just like <laughs> snowing, just drinking whiskey. We're all we're That's, all yeah. uh I'm tr- we're trying to think. Yeah, we were all wearing jackets, if I remember. I remember exactly what that apartment looked like, and I remember it had a deck. I do too. Out, and there was snow on top of the deck, and that's where Mike G was pissing, yada yada. Y'all invited us. That dude, that dude, Chris Maribate. You know Chris Maribate? I don't remember. It's a weird last name. It sounds a lot like Master Ray, but his name is Chris Maribate. <laughs> he's uh, Kurt. He's Kurt B's homie. You know Kurt B, Kurt Blankenship. Yeah, I know that dude. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's a head that, P. That, that, that's how. Yeah, and from he lives in Head PE now. Kurt's one of a real good friend of mine, but I don't know. They they are somehow involved Linked. or whatever. Yeah, because Kurt yeah. Kurt used to come to our shows back in those days. He used to see downtown Brown and shit. Is he a Cleveland dude? He's, yeah, he's from Akron. Kent. Kent. Or was it Kent or Akron? Akron. Kent. I think Kent. Kent. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, because I know the- Akron. Akron, I think. Rubber City? Is that Rubber City? They're like right next to us. Yeah, 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 whatever. Yeah, he had a whole crew that used to that that uh they used to come see our shows over there. Okay, so that must have been a trip when he started playing with you, Mike, because he like already knew McGregor and shit. It was a trip, and uh and it's even it's even been a long time now since we played together, but we still kick it. Like when he would lay, he lived down the street from me. Me and me and Kurt's thing is we play golf together. We go to like this little nine hole par three golf course and just like get get stoned and fuck around, talk shit about squirrels. You know what I mean? Cause like you can really get away when you play golf. But uh Yeah. Never never played, know. but I've I've done disc golf before. Have you ever done that shit where you throw the frisbee into the mm-hmm. Yeah. It kind of it's the same, it's the same thing. I know that golf seems a little cheesy or whatever, but it's fucking awesome, dude. It's and, and people say a lot kind of negative shit about golf. I'm not good at golf, but to me it's it's like you leave your it's just like another way of like leaving your fucking phone in the car and just like like when you it's such a silly game that that's what makes it <laughs> awesome. It's so like it's so silly. Like, what are we we're hitting a ball into a hole? Like I don't do I don't play it like people play it. I don't get I don't like get a fucking uh, polo shirt and go, we play like a shit, like it's par three course. It takes 45 minutes to play this course. You know what I mean? Like I just have, I, I think it's fun. I think golf is fun as shit. Yeah. And you got to do shit that takes you away from the mundane realities of being a human being in the United States of America. Yeah, in the, in the man. World. Yeah, man. It's so, very easy nowadays to get sucked into the, whatever the fuck this world is. You know what I mean? All the nonsense. Yeah, it's kind of terrifying, actually. I was just, I had a bunch of dads yelling at me that Devo sucks because I said Devo's cover of the Rolling Stones was better than the Rolling Stones on TikTok, and my, this shit blew up, and it's just a bunch of fucking angry dads, and they just have been yelling. At me. <laughs> I can't get no. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they've been yelling at me for three fucking days straight, dude. They're really pissed off. So that's you know that's how exciting my life has been. I uh, I took my cat to the vet. He's having diarrhea. So well, I think it's fucking fucked up on TikTok. Like that's the thing that blows up. And it's like I can picture you one one day making like some elaborate music video. That's what we like. I've had this experience. Like you put all this time and effort into your song, and nobody gives a shit. And then some random like you talking shit about Devo and Rolling Stones will probably get a gazillion views. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's almost at 100k, and and it's it is dumb because you put a lot of effort into editing 
And because I do a lot of video editing now, I make like short little fucking things where I just talk shit about stuff. And I like I like you as a personality, by mm-hmm. the way. I think it's awesome. Oh, thanks. But uh, but yeah, it's weird because the stuff you put the most work into, no one gives a fuck about. And, and right. there was this one video I made, which Mike, you saw where I'm just like screaming about, yeah, you should be in a band and you should fucking die. You should tour and die and eat garbage and die, you know, and like you gotta watch that. You gotta watch. That. And that shit got like, you know, it got like a lot of views and all these motherfuckers are like, yeah. Cause what? that was that shit that I, what I realized about TikTok, and I'm not like a big, I'm not really, I can't get into TikTok. I don't know, but what I realize is like what works on there, and what I do like about it is like humanity shit. Like you're just hu- like just being a human being, like because we all are that. Yeah. You, know? you got to see this video. It's, it, it's like it was some, it's, I and seen you it. see like I see it every fucking where on the online is, and I see videos like the one that you saw. It's like a guy. It's like a guy going like, if you want to succeed, you have to do this. This. Well, he was saying he was saying like, it's not financially viable to tour. What you need to do is you need to go on TikTok and make sure you don't. When you make a song, don't have an intro because the algorithm does. Like you know, that's there's yeah, all these yeah, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's one of those dudes. Out. And if Neil just made like a reply video, he's like, or you can fucking get with your friends and get in a van and go around, and not give a fuck because you love it. Because you know what I'm saying? And it's like. Cats like are, are, are there's so many things like making music for the purpose of success nowadays. It is like, ugh. you know, there was a dude. There was a dude the other day. I, I didn't say anything, but I kind of wanted to. It like, <laughs> this big. It, I, I follow this. I don't give a fuck. I follow this account called Indie Amplify, where it's just like independent artists like giving advice for independent artists. Yeah. But there was this big dude on there. He's a hip hop beats producer, and he was talking about how to get playlisted on Spotify. And he was like. You got to not ever have intros and outros on your songs. You absolutely have to use modern drums. You have to ever had. And he's basically saying you have to fuck. He was basically saying you must do what the corporation wants. You must conform, conform. <laughs> and it was just not punk rock to me. <laughs> yeah. And you know, you want to was what? <laughs> That's punk rock. That's punk rock. See, man, was punk rock is smoking cigarettes for fucking years, so you can't even <laughs> imitate somebody without dying of fucking cancer. <laughs> <laughs> What's what punk rock is, is is lack of lung God, function. Damn. But but, but uh, you know what I'm saying? This dude was basically saying like, it's like, why'd you get into music in the first place? If you do, if you're just like, all you care about is getting your. It's like. If you're just doing it for success, why'd you even start doing it? Do fucking do stocks. You know what I mean? Yeah. If you just want to like analyze an algorithm and make your stuff work, the, there's better ways to do it. And definitely ways with more chance of success than being a musician. You got to fucking see a. Talk about it. <laughs> fucking love that shit. Yeah. And well, what's funny is a lot of these like gurus that give all the TikTok tips or Instagram hack tips, like when you actually go on their profile, they got like 3K followers and shit. It's just right. like, okay, if you're such a fucking guru and you got the algorithm hack, then why why is nobody fucking with you? That's my question. And that, that's why when this dude posted that shit and I kept seeing it, because the way TikTok works is it sends you random shit. You know, it does. Yeah. it doesn't like... It sends you just random shit that the algorithm is like, oh, you, you know, you're into this, this, and this, so you're gonna like this, this, and this. It's all, it's all just a robot sending you this random shit. And they kept sending me this dude, and he's like, why is touring not a viable, uh, uh, you, you know, <laughs> investment opportunity? And I just, I didn't like his face. I didn't like what he was saying. And then I fired back, and he actually hit me up in the comments after I screamed and went on a rant. He's like, "He's right too," and I'm just like, "Oh!" And then we made friends, and then I talked to him on my podcast. So he's he's actually oh, I gotta like, watch that. Oh, episode. that's cool. He's actually not that much of a square. He was like, you know, he did the original um, music grind thing, and he toured, and he did all the shit that we did like early on when we were young. And well, the thing is, he's not he's not wrong. First of all, first right. of all, he's not wrong. Second of all, I can talk all the shit I want, but. Yeah, I, especially especially recently, I'm trying to do well on all that shit. I I can talk shit about TikTok. I want to blow up on TikTok. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm just like I'm kind of even recently like, how about I have take a try a little bit harder to be like, don't like 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 try to try to have some success. Use some strategies. Put hashtags on your posts. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I try, I'm trying to do some some shit like that too. So that. I don't want to make it seem like I'm like not at all on the train because he he is right, but it's I just can't help but think like it's just lame. Like, why are you doing this? If if like like the the days you're talking about where we were fucking 
you know, the alcohol and all that shit is, it could be a different story, but like those right. days, like being in a van and fucking sleeping on somebody's floor, those were the fucking good old days. Yeah. You know what I'm saying we, I'm not like, yeah, those days suck. Cause we didn't make any money. Like that's what was cool about yeah, it. But like only t- you got to get only, through that shit. Dude. Only got- 10 people came to the show. That's the best. When you look back on it, that's the greatest Listen, stories and just hilarious. Model in the music industry. You're absolutely right. Being in a band is not a great way to make a living. But you know what? You should do it anyway. You should drive around the country. You should sleep in fucking Walmarts. And you should eat fucking garbage. And you should play music with your friends. And you should die doing it. Because there's <laughs> fucking some things worth living for. And one of them is playing music with your friends. And driving. And eating. And dying. So why are bands no longer? I fucking <laughs> yeah, love, I love that. That's great. As you can see by the red heart. Yeah. Yo, I got a red heart. Um, that's how much. That's how much I loved it. I went like this. Yeah, I fucking tapped my phone, but but that's the thing. I think I think it's about a healthy balance between, you know, like trying to work with the platforms that are out nowadays in order to get your shit out there. And what I'm noticing is a lot of it is like humanity based and personality based. Like that dude Oliver Tree. Like so much of his shit is just like wild memes and him riding around on big scooters and like having weird haircuts. But then. He he tosses in the music as well. Now it is his music at a caliber that I sit, I would think that like what you guys are doing is no, not at all. It's like it, you know. But but then again, it's like we're living in an era where what y'all came up on and what y'all do really well is considered like I don't know. Like, do you ever get that like old head, new head kind of back and forth about what? Yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, I mean, you know, you get old and, and kids don't listen to the same shit anymore. I'm, I've really officially reached the point where, like, don't get me wrong, there's tons of there's tons of new music that I like, yeah, tons of it. And there's and and the cool thing is there's so much now that you can always find something cool. And a lot of kids are making music that's based on some old shit that they heard because even if you're young now you have your access to anything. If you discover something from the 1940s, it's still new, new to you. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just, just like we had the swing revival in the nineties, you know what I'm saying? Yo, I but, was uh, there. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Zoot Suit Riot. Exactly. Cherry but, Pop man, and Daddy. Man. Man. That's a, that's a terrible band name, by the way. Cherry Pop and Daddies is just, that's fucking yo, dude. <laughs> like what? Yeah, it, ju- it just kicked it. Ju- that just, registered now i never thought about like what those words mean together that's so fucking weird i never really thought about cherry popping like that like yo that was daddies, a yeah yeah that was a band on mtv like yo the cherry popping daddies is like yikes like I, I, yeah i don't think that would fly if you go back and if you me and chris talk about the swing era all the time because if you go back and listen to it now it's like it's like let's Let's play swing music as bad as it could possibly be played. It's fucking bad. Dude. The the music that they're trying to emulate from so like good. The thing about that yeah. stuff from the, the original swing, that was when you had to be a badass musician. When when think when they recorded stuff, it was like an orchestra in a studio. No one could fuck up. You're playing hours every night. Whatever instrument you're on, you're a fucking badass. Yeah. And then you have like some. I can only assume that maybe they were like a started as a ska band and decided to do swing. I don't know. You just find a kid. It's like a you try find to you find, you find a kid in your neighborhood that played trombone in middle school and he can barely fucking play it and shit. And now you're the cherry pop of daddies. Come on, man. Yeah, but you know, maybe, maybe I, you know, I'm a hater a little bit, maybe. Dude, so. this motherfucker's hating on the cherry pop and daddies. Yeah, dude, get the fuck out of here. Get out of here with your cherry pop and hate. Yeah, I just... It just hit me how problematic that band name is because wh- what's weird is our brains are all rewired now to be. I'm mean, not to say that I'm hyper offended by things, but I'm hyper aware of what is offensive, just as almost a survival tactic because I want to operate in society in a way where I'm not going to be talking to a stranger and immediately be deemed as an insensitive piece of shit. So, so that's but so yeah. So you think I just bring up cherry pop and daddy's? I'm like that's problematic. I didn't used right. to think that way. I was just like cherry popping daddies. Dude. Yeah. I don't even remember why I brought up cherry popping. It was, a, it was just different. Like in, you know, we watched these comedy movies from the eighties. It's unbelievable. The shit that were like the mainstream movies from back then, revenge of the nerves, that type of shit. It's, it's absolutely unbelievable. The shit that they would do and no one would say anything. Yeah. I mean, I heard the song, uh, 
We were talking about hair hair metal earlier. I heard the winger song 17 the other day. She's only Yo. 17. And what is it? She'll give you love like you never. Seen. It's like no one. It was not controversial at all. Nope. And my wife and I were talking about how like how we, we were trying to figure out when it was decided that like 18 was like the acceptable like. See, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm saying is and I don't give a fuck. I'm, I'm old now, so I can say controversial things. It's. <laughs> And if you listen, if you listen to mu- to music from the fifties, she's only sweet sixteen. Yeah, it was and God. Like it's like people got married back then, younger. People got married when they were fourteen. 15, That's what we were talking about, like Jerry Lee Lewis, and like, like you get that married was to a thing. thirteen year old. That was just what it was. If you're gonna say, like it, w- w- people act like oh, so one day you turn eighteen and now you're a an adult. You know what I'm saying? Like it's just some magical number. It's that, not though. Who knows? Who knows who fucking made that shit up? I think I think there's a lot of twenty year olds that are fucking children too. Yo, I mean? there's like, there's fucking twenty six year olds that are children, man. Right. Like, yeah, I'm yeah. I'm my girlfriend's thirty three and she's like the most mature person I've ever dated because I was you know, I was always dating girls in their twenties because they were the you know, girls in their twenties were the only ones that would check up with some guy that lives out of a van, you know. I don't know. I had low self esteem. I didn't think I deserved good things. But um yeah, I don't know. It's it's fucking weird. Yeah, people in their 20s are kids, man. Like that that magic number 18 that doesn't equate adulthood. Like you turn 18 and Im- immediately you're adult. Yo. I think it's so fucking creepy when people are like like people are like, "Oh yeah, she's barely legal. She just turned 18." <laughs> that means what you really want her to be a fucking kid. What, what yes, yeah, she might be legal. But you're really you're trying to fuck a kid. You're getting by on a you're technicality. Like, yeah, look at her. She looks yeah. younger. You're like than can't, that, can't wait till she's, that. she's 18. But doesn't she look younger than that? Though she's barely legal. She looks like she's less than 18, doesn't she? And that's that's, that's fucking, anything that's like a bare the idea of like barely legal is like let's find an 18 year old that looks 15. Yeah, you know, that's yeah, like yeah. the whole idea. That's just it. as creepy. Dude. That's just, super creepy. And yo, like uh, on doesn't it, do it for me. On HBO, there's this documentary that just came out, and the, the it, this girl uh, was a, this actress, Evan Rachel Wood, started dating Marilyn Manson. She was 18, and he was 37. And like, yo, what? Jerry Seinfeld had a girl like that. Too. Yeah, what 37 year old is like? I want to date an 18 year old. Like, it, it just you know, it may it may be like a fleeting kind of. Um, desire or something that you like slap out of your head but to actually like pursue and have a relationship with someone that's a fucking child when you're close to 40 that's just fucked up and and then he what you're looking for i feel i feel like that he's looking for somebody he can control exactly because because that's what the whole documentary is about he abused her and sexually assaulted her for years and years like four and a half years of torture and she's like got mad ptsd from it and she like is doing all this who was the guy it was marilyn manson you said marilyn manson yeah Damn. And, and who would have thought? Yeah. I <laughs> seemed pretty normal to me. <laughs> who would have seen the signs? Yeah. Seemed like a pretty chill guy. But um yeah, it's just it's yeah, 18, yo. Fuck there's people that are 29 that are kids in my eyes, you know? And, yeah. I see like college kids, like when I go uh I go to a coffee shop near the local university, the kids look like they're in middle school to me yo and he goes he goes there to jerk off yeah <laughs> and i go I don't, I don't no reason i go there i just you know kind of go hang out just park my van for a while yeah no big deal no big deal no big deal whatsoever uh, i always know it's neil every time i you always had a girl that's true <laughs> like you're, you're you're like kind of like uh what do they call it serial serial monogamous. monogamous yeah yeah i i well i realized in therapy that the that uh, the reason I did that is because here, I'll give you the quick explanation. When I was a little kid, my daddy didn't love me and I was never validated by him. So um, as I grew into adulthood, I, I sought validation from people that reminded me of my father and to the negative parts of my dad. So I would date women that were mean, that were unavailable, cold, callous, and then I would seek validation from them that I would never get, uh, thus mimicking the relationship between my father and I. And that was a perpetual cycle that lasted from my first adult relationship in about 2003 until 2016 when homegirl was sleeping with the cover band guy and that's the brief history of my relationship thing that was fucking awesome yeah yeah 
Yeah, well, that's like the I, I want to talk. That fast. was said. That was said. That was said like a like a dude who does a podcast. Like that was really fucking well said. Well, thanks, dude. I, I just wanted to to get it over with because I want to hear what y'all have to say. And I feel like sometimes I go on these tangents where I'm like me, 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 and it's like whatever, dude. I think a lot of like uh, I've gone to therapy before, and I, I think a lot of times it's uh, you know, parent. There's always it goes back to like parent related issues. You know, yeah. It's always like, well, your dad did this, and you're trying to emulate. That. It's like a lot of times. I mean, I say that meaning that it's true. It's based on truth, and well, um, uh, all that shit manifests later in life. You know, it comes back. It's um, from my understanding, it's Freud. It's Freudian. Like all the parent <laughs> shit. I can't I say I want to talk shit because it's like really fucking obvious Magabias <laughs> over here. Fucking really does it go back to parenting? What are you fucking making new revelations over here? Well, there was a time, honestly, where <laughs> I thought it was the fucking if it was that obvious, people was, wouldn't go to therapy. They would just the be ancient, like, Oh, I guess it's my parents. Oh, I think that okay. it's because the, the fucking okay. temples that the ancient Mayans made must have gotten into your water supply. That's uh, why you're right like there. That. I didn't know, know you had a PhD in uh, psychotherapy. That's Tom know you, Cruise. I didn't know you knew everything. That's what Tom Cruise believes. You if know? it were so obvious, like you're saying, then there would be no need. Everybody would just already know their own diagnosis and be like, oh, well, my dad did this, so I did that. And then I wanted to do this. Well, yeah, but, but his shit was specific. The pro- well, this is the thing is <laughs> what I was trying to say is for a long time, it Fucking wasn't. <laughs> for, for a long time, the Freudian, like your mom, your dad did this, therefore you ended up like this. That shit wasn't uh, accepted widely in society. And now that shit is the basis of all modern psychology is your dad did this. So, so Mike, what you're talking about is like this common knowledge that didn't used to exist. That Freudian common knowledge didn't used to be a thing. And now, now, yeah, but, but Freud was a minute ago. This motherfucker act like Freud just came out yesterday. You know I, mean? I don't know. <laughs> I just like, I just like talking. Well, shit. why don't Talk we just shit. minimize? Maybe we should all just minimize people's struggles with mental health and just act like it's a, something to laugh about. I'm not. Are you making fun of me? <laughs> no, he is. No, but, but he but, is. I'm, not. I'm making fun of him. But, I don't think, I think he's being a little bit insensitive, frankly. Oh, I, I you're not going to offend me, dude. It doesn't matter. Nothing matters. No, he, I mean, I'm not being. He thinks I'm being insensitive to him. Oh, no, you're you're being insensitive to Neil as well as me. Maybe that may be the case. Well, you know what? I'm highly maybe offended. Guys, maybe you guys need to fucking toughen up. You know? <laughs> no, that, that's, that yo, that's what my dad would say. But <laughs> but but long story short, yeah, you, your parents fuck you up, and then you end up doing a bunch of shit that you don't even realize you're doing it because you're like seeking some sort of validation. And a lot of that came the the drinking. You know, came for that. The, well, and, and a lot of it has is is predisposed by genetics, like the addictive tendencies. Yo, my whole family are a bunch of mentally ill drug addicts. Like, and it, you you pick the drug, mostly alcohol. You know, so yeah, yeah. So I just kind of followed in my family's footsteps, and I was just a little crazy and definitely anxious and worrying. Uh, and yeah, but I, I'm doing well. I think I'm doing all right. I'm doing better than I have ever. I think. I mean, that's all that matters it, it, it is that I think there. If you think you're doing better than you are. I had an ex tell me once, like, oh, your new girlfriend is getting the best version of you. And and I remember being like, yeah, like, what am I going to do? Give her like a shittier version than I gave you? You know, like, am I going to like, re- like, am I going to regress and just give that's, you know, that's it's, funny because I'm, I'm, I'm in a I'm in a relationship now and it's going really, really, really well. It's all awesome. good. But good. Uh, it's. I, I often think about like how like she doesn't know like she she really met me at a good time in my life you know oh like, yeah she, like if she had, like she doesn't know how fucking crazy I once was <laughs> you know she doesn't know yeah and, t- and, and, and like I know it's I could return to that it's not impossible you know what I mean couple yeah. couple crazy nights and I, I could be crazy again you know but. Network. Yeah, not, I'm gonna knock on this fake wood too. Well, well, and that's that's the thing is is they don't know they don't know where we've been. It's uh, like that in the movie Fight Club where uh, Brad Pitt is like bleeding all over the owner of the yeah. bar, and he's like, "You don't know where I've been, Lou. You don't right. know where I've been." <laughs> and I tell my girlfriend that I'm like, I'm like, yo, like you, if you knew me in 2003 and tried to date me, we would not get along very well. Like it would be pretty fucking gnarly. I was pretty intense, so. 
Yeah, you've been in the abyss. Yeah, I've been in dark places, man. Well, I'm glad your new relationship is going well, and I'm glad you're a healthy version of yourself, you know? Like I said, I would have gone to therapy. That was years ago. I was just depressed and sad and mad, and I would just sometimes get, like, like low fuse, you know, from just, like, feeling like this shit, just, like, oh, yeah. stress that you can't let out, and you're, like, like someone says the wrong shit, and I'm just like, what about it? you know? And um, I know that shit. I've learned tools to control this sort of thing, and I've just... Uh, I've been pretty at peace. You know, I do get stressed out a lot, but I try to, um, you know, use positive, positive ways to de-stress, such as meditation, playing music, shit like that. Yeah. You don't golf? I don't golf. I surf. Oh, you surf? I should be. Yeah. Surf is. Um, By the way, I don't golf. I only golf with Kurt. Oh, <laughs> word. Like, I don't I don't golf. Like, right, I don't. I'm I don't. Like some, I'm not like some adamant golfer. I don't. I like, never got that impression. Yeah. It, it, we're and me and Kurt. Me and Kurt play golf at this dumb I, golf course. I think I to your golf, <laughs> golf would get. Le- if you became serious as in golf, I think it gets less fun from yeah. my observation because then you take it seriously. Surfing, I think, is like that too. Where if you start to get better, and then you're like, if you get to a point where you can get frustrated because like, oh, I didn't catch that wave, or I didn't make that shot, or whatever. That's when it starts to be. It's almost like better if you kind of remain more of a more of a on the beginner level where you're just doing it to have fun. You know, just being out there is is part of the is the main thing just to escape. You know, I feel like most activities, once you start to take it seriously, it starts to suck a little bit, you know. Yeah, it goes back to what you're saying about music in a way, you know, I'm I enjoy being on stage so much more now when it. Because back in the day, it was part of this like, well, I got to make it. I got to make it. I got to make it. I, I have to do this. I And so we would say yes to every single shitty tour that was offered to us. And we would drive all types of crazy distances. And I remember I remember when we met Two Skinny Jays, I said, what advice would you give an up and coming band? And I forgot which member of the band told me this. But he said, he said, don't overexert yourself. Like as far as uh, touring, he's like, don't travel too much to the point where it sucks the joy out of everything and then i didn't listen to that dude i just started i was like you know the old business model if you get in a van and you drive around it'll grow and it'll grow and then what happens like 15 years go by and it hasn't really grown a whole lot you know like or the growth is just at a much slower pace than like you know dude, well, I mean, it, does it, grow. it might not even it might not not it might i mean my shit's shrunk my shit went like this and then it goes down. Sure. But the, so I'm kind of on Neil's team where it's like now when I do a tour, like when I'm on the stage, like, yeah, it might not be as many people. It might be the same venue, but like, oh, it's not quite as full as it was last time. But I'm just like, let's have fun, dude. Let's you got to. My, my favorite part of touring now is the show. The exactly. Fucking show. Like I have even if it's the same fucking songs every night. I fucking reach out. I, I have fun doing the goddamn show, man. More than more so than I did. When I was like, when I was on that, like, this has got to be growth and everything. Like, more, I have way more fun now than I did when I was doing bigger shows. It's because you got that hindsight. I feel, I feel like I had, man, you get that hindsight to the point where you're able to tell yourself, I'm so fucking lucky to be able to be doing this. Like, dude, I'm, mm. I'm 41 years old and people, not a lot of people, but people still pay money to see me get on a microphone and spit and do dumb shit. You know, and and that's a beautiful fucking thing. I just did it this weekend, and there, yo, I never popped off. Like I never had a gold record. I never fucking like. But I don't know. It's just to be in the moment, especially knowing that my time is waning. Like I don't know when I'm gonna die. I don't know if I'm gonna mm-hmm. die when I'm fucking forty two. If I'm gonna die tomorrow. If I'm gonna die when I'm sixty seven. But the fact of the matter is, is right now I'm able bodied enough, and I've structured my life in a way where I could still act like an idiot on stage and and there's that childlike uh freedom in performance and and that's just a beautiful thing no matter how many people are fucking watching and i gotta tell myself that i I have to literally beat it into my brain you're not gonna do this forever you're not gonna be alive forever like you have to enjoy now and before it was always just like you know fucking you know just i would always find dumb shit to complain about like not getting paid enough there not being enough people you know, I was always comparing myself to other people. I mean, yeah, Mike and I talked about this at the uh, when he saw me play with that punk band. Yeah, because I was telling you, like, I mean, shit, I I did like I have a gold record, but you know, is that it back there? Yeah, there's an asterisk behind it because that's a gold record in uh, 
it's not in America. It's in Germany. You have to sell less no matter what. I'm like, but that's not a good enough. That's not good enough. It's not really a thing. It's not really a this. It's Plus, amazing. It was fun. Plus it, it is amazing, but, but it, but it also was 10 years ago. But, uh, but I'm saying my point is this, my point is no matter if you pop off, no matter how many people, your shows, you can have fucking 500 people, at your shows, you want to have a thousand, you have a thousand people, at your shows, you want to have 2000 yeah. all the way to the top. And when you're at the top, you have to try to fucking king of the mountain and stay at the top, you know, and then people are like, what the fuck happened to him? You know, all these rat like Ching yeah. or whoever. I think it's actually it worse. Ja Rule or whatever. Like it's kind of, it's kind of, it's kind of worse. Millie, Van, Millie Vanilli guy wouldn't have killed himself if they had never made it probably. You know what I'm saying? No, like, he'd probably like just have some regular ass job and still be alive. But that, yeah, that shit it's, it's this, addiction to validation and that's you know back to the whole therapy thing that's what i was learning uh that's what i learned with with me in relationships and me also too with like doing this music shit is so much of 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 me wanting strangers to be like you're great i love you i love what you do is a way of me being like fuck you dad somebody loves me you know and it it like what i've been working on is just being like looking in the mirror and being like yeah, you're pretty cool and you work really hard and you're dope even if no one thinks you're dope kind of thing. I got to tell my, and that's where I'm at right hard. now. It, it's really hard. It's hard, man. Like, no, like cause some people get stuck in that, in that, like, not, ever, it's never enough validation thing. And I feel like, I feel like it's kind of a trap too, because the longer you do it, the more you're going to inevitably, whether you're doing it for the, for your, the validation of your dad or, or just doing it because the longer that you do it, the more you're like, damn, I deserve validation. I've been working at this for 30 years. What the oh, fuck yeah. is at the end? What's the, what's at the end of this fucking tunnel? You know, I know people, I know people like that, you know, and I'm like that to a degree, you know what I'm saying? But, you know, honestly, yeah. honestly, what I think a lot of that comes down to is uh, what's, what's that fucking word I'm looking for? They feel like they're self they're entitled, entitled, entitlement. entitlement. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Like, okay. So, so, for the longest time in my eyes and it also has a lot to do with the way I was raised. I was raised in a suburb of Detroit where fucking people, people succeeded and they got what they wanted. And we had, I went to a good school and kids like fucking got cars and shit. So in my mind, you know, I was, I was like in a family that was kind of faking it. Like my mom put us in there because of the schools, but I had to like buy my own car. I had to like get a job and stuff, but there's an entitlement that comes with being a suburban fucking white kid where you think that you deserve shit just because you see everyone around you is getting shit all the time. And I like, honestly, when I started doing the music thing, I was like, I am talented because my teachers and my choir teacher and my art teacher all tell me I'm talented and all the kids at school told me I'm talented. So not, not only am I going to get this, but I fucking deserve it. And I went in to like quitting college and starting a rock band with that fucking mentality that like I deserve this for for why because I'm talented there's so many more factors you know that the word even the even the word deserve is weird it's yo like, nobody does des- nobody deserves anything Shit. man nobody deserve people des- people don't deserve to get hit by a fucking bus you know like that like That's nobody true. like Nobody for for everybody that like you be for everybody that be like damn they worked really hard they deserve to make it they deserve to get a Grammy they deserve to for everybody that like we we say deserved it there's so many people that worked just as hard that that didn't get it or that fucking got cancer and died or whatever did Straight they deserve up. that you know what I'm saying like what well, and. Yeah, I mean, I know a bunch of motherfuckers that are like really talented musicians that have sick bands that write amazing songs that have never seen the light of day. And it just is what it is. Like if you're not in the right place at the right time, if you don't make the right connections, if you're not pretty, if the type of music you make isn't popping, like there's people there's people that work two fucking jobs and and to barely survive. They deserve a mansion. They work true. harder. They work harder than most people that have one, you know what I mean? They deserve one, but they're not going to get one because they're, they're, the job that they do is not as lucrative as somebody who fucking sits there and they're- I, I I know people who have like good jobs that are lazy and just like, yo, I got this job. I don't have to, I don't, I don't understand this mentality, especially as like an adult where it's like, I got, I don't even have to work that hard and I'm, they're paying me this. And I just kind of like <laughs> bullshit all day. I'm like, don't, you don't have any ambition whatsoever to do well in life. Like, 
you don't deserve it, but they still feel like they deserve it. You know what I mean? Like so it's all types of different examples of that. I got a buddy actually who, who is a saw is he was a software developer and he lives uh, in San Diego, like we're all kind of in a rich area. Everybody yeah. else works in technology. A lot of people have like dual income homes working in technology. And he, he sees all the people like in his neighborhood, like driving their Tesla and like, you know, getting the pool installed or whatever they're doing. He just recently got a, a second job and like works f- two full-time jobs, like unbeknownst to the other company. Like he's Yikes. just simultaneously working two fucking full-time software developer jobs because he's like, I, I see the, what they, what wealth they have. And I thought by the time I was this age that I'd have that level of wealth to provide, he's doing fine as he was already doing fine. But right. like, it's like this external pressure where he feels like he's supposed to be, you know, at a different level and he's comparing himself to his surroundings. And, um, yeah, it can really affect people. I don't know. I don't want that, dude. No. <laughs> like, I don't give a fuck about a pool or what kind of car. Like, does my car work? Do I put the keys in it? Does it start? Cool. Can you get me places? Tight. I mean, I have a van, dude. I, I just bought, a, like, a used van. It's one of those transits, but... How many times have you bought a used van? <laughs> Let's count it. Uh, 2006. No, no. no. 08. Then we crashed that one on some black ice. Then I bought one in 2010. I that. And then I bought one in 2016. And then I bought one in 2021. So I'm on my fourth full-size Ford cargo van. I got to stick with Ford because my grandpa is a Ford retiree. He's no longer on this planet. But I, I do it to honor Ed, my grandfather. He fought in World War II. Uh, he fought in France as a sergeant in the u.s army yo and he willed my brother and i all this nazi shit which is crazy and we sold it on ebay to fucking off-duty police officers crazy (laughs) yeah like like the people that collect that shit are are mad sketchy dude i don't know i would think they're usually collecting it on like to they're with that that's their their shit it's tough to say like are they with it because some people just like history but but let, let me just put it this way. When we got that case of Nazi shit, I brought it to a gun show so I could get it appraised. And when I opened, you know, you, you remember like Raiders of the Lost Ark when they opened the Ark of the Covenant and all, all the like light comes out. It, like immediately I opened up the fucking briefcase that all the Nazi shit was in. And it, it was like all these old white people like could smell it and they swarmed it. And the guy who was appraising it was like swatting him away. And he's like, gentlemen, gentlemen. He's like, this was brought to me, you know, and fucking he appraised all the fucking crazy Nazi like daggers and Nazi weapons, Nazi emblems, uh, like badges, flag. Like, yo, it was it was like a briefcase of death. And that's why my brother and I decided wow. to get rid of it, because I'm like, I'm like what am I going to do? Yeah. Like, hang like this bad. shit. Bad juju. Am I going to hang this yeah. shit in my fucking basement? Like, no, like, let's, let's fucking sell it and split the money. So we did. That's fucking fascinating, man. What, how much did, how much did that stuff go for? Thousands of dollars. Damn. Yeah. The reason I have this laptop is because I bought a laptop in 2012 when I sold all the Nazi stuff and then I just kept trading it into Apple. So I'm like, I can't be on this podcast anymore if you have a Nazi funded laptop. I'm sorry. I mean, <laughs> it's. That's crazy. Is it actually? I, I don't know. It, do you think? No, I don't think so. But if it was fun, if it was like your your grandpa got it from dead Nazis, then you could argue that it was the opposite of that. That's probably what happened. Yeah, he killed them motherfuckers, man. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He never yeah, the. Go ahead. It, I I watch. I was just gonna say, like, I mean, there is something to. I watch World War II documentaries all the time, and it doesn't. You know, it's just a fascinating time in history. So maybe those people that bought it are just interested in the historical accuracy of the the items they're just historical white supremacists you know that's right what's up <laughs> yeah but either way that shit was weird like i've like I, I might tell that story one day on tiktok or something it's an interesting story but opening up that that briefcase of death and all the fucking old fat like pink faced white dudes like swarming it like it was some sort of it was that was some shit that was some of the weirdest shit i've ever witnessed in my life it was in Ohio too, Toledo, Ohio. Wow. Yeah, fucking crazy, o- dude. Fucking Ohio, man. 
Yeah, Toledo is a weird place too. It is a weird place. I'm playing a show there at the. I like that. I I, I like it though. I like that. There's a lot of cool people there. There's cool people everywhere. I think. I agree. I agree a hundred percent, Neil. There's, I mean, you know what's funny is when I moved out to LA, I, like, think about how many people live in Los Angeles County or, and then how many people live in the actual city. And then you get all these people from where I'm from, which is pretty much like a small town vibe. Like Detroit is a big city, small town. And everyone's just like, everyone's fake out there, bro. And it's like, yeah, there's a lot of shitheads, but like to, to say that, you know, a county, how many is it? What fifteen million people in LA County? It's fucking something like that. It's, yeah. it, it's massive. They're all fake, all of them. People love shitting on LA. Yeah, it's a thing. California, 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 California in general. Yeah, most of people haven't even been there. When I was uh, leaving California, I made a video about it, like a story time video, and I put it on my YouTube, and just all the comments were just like. They're like, "Good, get out of there! The liberals are ruining it." Blah blah blah. It's like you haven't even been there. I mean, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Do you? It's definitely. I see that in my, like my Facebook feed of people just like basically shitting on California that have never been there, and like um, they don't realize like even in LA, but especially in places like if you go east in San Diego, like. It's not some liberal bastion. It's like we have like neo Nazis and rednecks and all that shit more so than oh, yeah. a lot of the places where where the people are commenting from. Like we have, it's pretty. It's, it's just a very very diverse in its viewpoints. Let's say. Yeah, Orange County's fucking weird, dude. Orange County, mm-hmm. there's a uh, yeah, and that, and that's weird too. Is you have LA's it had the giant like BLM demonstrations, and then in Orange County you had all the fucking Trumpers. You know, it's just it's like. It's like two different planets, but it, they're right next to each other. It's fucking wild. Do you? How do you like living in San Diego, Mike? Are you enjoying it better than LA, or is it kind of more chill? <clears throat> yeah, I like it. I, I still go up to LA a lot to work, to work on music stuff, and um, I've been going up there a lot recently. I've been super, super busy. Good. But, uh, no, I like I like San Diego, but I mostly like it because my family, Chris and his my nephews, are here. Now I got a girlfriend here, which is awesome. I got some issues going on with the apartment that I live in, but that's a, you know, I don't, that's another thing. We don't need to get into that, but that's, I love San Diego, man. Love he San lives Diego. a block from the beach. So in the, as far as surroundings, it's very, in general, the area is awesome and tranquil and beautiful, but um, yeah, yeah. there's always, it's fire. you know, there's always, are you an OB? Go, she can go down anywhere. I am. I was when, yeah, where you met me, I walked. Oh, you walk. Okay, tight. Yeah, it's cool down there. Yeah, it's cool. That's where the dudes in Slightly Stupid got their shit going. Yeah, right. yeah. I'm saying also uh, Jewel play, uh, and Jason Mraz both kind of like played in like the local scene there. Who, Jewel the Yodeler from the 90s? Yeah, yeah. Yo. <laughs> yeah. She, dude, yeah. I didn't know it, but Jewel yodels like a, like fucking, she was on that Lilith Fair and she has a whole solo. Where she would just do like five minutes of YOLO. A uh, YOLO. That was the original. Yeah, yeah, solo no, YOLO. YOLO. That's the shit. So yeah, Grizzly season was 06, wasn't it? Yep. Grizzly season. Wax Nurble T. Wax Nurble T. So that was recorded half and we started in uh, in Baltimore. Then we moved. I moved out here and we, I guess you came out. We finished it out here. So what is, what are your feelings in general kind of a full circle type thing considering that that's like y'all were both living in San Diego and had just left Maryland made that record and now it's like how many years later it's, four, it's like 16, 16 years later I remember when when you when Mike hit me up on MySpace and he's like I want to send you our new record you know I remember getting that CD I remember I was at this apartment I used to live with with my ex and I remember it- it's, it it's was still, one of, yeah. it's, still holds up, dude. We just listened to it. It's fucking great. Thanks, go, man. Go cub the go cub the mathematical and uh, there's yeah the sense of humor is is super thick. Like you could tell you guys had a blast making that shit. Yeah, it's it, that's why like a lot of people don't understand it. It's kind of like a, the whole thing is kind of like almost a inside joke between me and him. Yeah. you know, and it's but like but it's so funny thinking back to it. Like, and I know you can relate as any, anybody who makes albums can like at the time it seemed like the biggest deal 
it seemed like it seemed at least like in my mind, in my in my it was like this, this album is a big deal. We gotta make this fucking shit tight. And I, I yeah. mean, we, but we made half of the shit on like a four track. Basically, we made like like or it's not like it's not like we were like it's not like when I say that I mean like let's go to the nicest studio and pet, spend all this money on it. We just wanted to make it cool, you know. But when I when I look back at that album more than any album I've done since then, it's really just like it's just whatever we want to do. We didn't think anybody else would ever hear it. I don't think. I think we kind of like made it in the vibe of like. I don't know that anybody will ever hear this. I don't know that we'll ever make an album again. I don't know. You know, I think that that's yeah. kind of what we were thinking when we made it. It was, yeah. I feel like every, t- every time I fucking am involved with that album, I'm kind of thinking like, oh, I'm never going to make another album again. Right. And yeah. then you get bored and you're like, I'm going to start making shit. Yeah. You immediately, you're like, before you're even done, you're working on something. Else. Right. That's why you always like, people are always like, this is my final album. I'm retiring. And they never do because it's like, then a like, year or two later, you're like, oh, I got this new idea for a song and it just evolves into it like i don't think it's easy to retire as a musician if you really are a musician i feel like a lot of that shit is just marketing like ozzy's how many last tours have ozzy and kiss had you know like the final 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 tour you know like i think it is marketing but i think there's also an element of like one day you're just like i'm done with this shit man this is our fucking retirement tour fuck all this we're done last album and then you just change your tune because people's you ebb and flow with the way like your mood and the way, you you know, over the years, everybody has like ebbs and flows of how they're feeling and about their life or about their career or whatever. And you, you might- for musicians from and for musicians, it's like you don't realize when you quit, like what the fuck else are you going to do? Bro? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's why that's why the local bar by my house, like Coolio plays there, Young MC plays there, Tone Loke plays there, all these bands that you'd be like, oh, what are they still doing? It's like. If you're tone low, you can still do a lot better playing wild thing at little shows than if you like became a fucking banker or, or whatever the fuck yeah. became a you like went and became a massage therapist. I don't know. Like, yeah, dude, if I had a hit song, man, I would milk that shit so hard. I would milk and 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 I would play that shit every night with a giant grin on my face and just be like, yeah, like this is why I'm here. Everyone's singing along. Give me my fucking guarantee. Let's go. You know, I interviewed right. the dude from the Verve Pipe. Do you remember that song? The For the life of me, I cannot remember what made us think that we were wise and we'd never compromise. You remember that one? No. No, no. but I like the way you sang it. Was that the chorus? That's the chorus. I don't remember that one. It was big. It was all over I remember MTV. a band called The Verve. Same it year. Bitter, it came, Bittersweet Symphony, right? It came out the same year. Um, I'm trying to think. You don't remember for the life of me, I cannot remember. <laughs> he's he's like maybe I put a little more emotion into it. They'll remember. And the song was called. It goes for it's the life of me. I can't remember. It's called the freshman. The song's called the freshman. We're, I bet if if you we actually, were merely freshmen, we'd probably know it if we heard it. We, but it came out the same year as the verb. Anyway, I interviewed that guy on my podcast. It was, amazing, it was awesome how you like in, your impression. You just went harder. Like we're gonna be like, oh shit, that one. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, you know, if at first it doesn't work, repeat. I guess my brain. The verb pipe. The verb pipe. And anyway, I interviewed that dude, and he 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 just has a really healthy attitude about his hit song, and he's just like, yeah, he's like, everywhere I go when I play that song, it takes people back to where they were when they were young, and it's really special to them. And and he's like, and I I wouldn't resent that ever. And also, he's making money, so he's able to f- feed his fucking kids with it. So it's like. So yeah. So what's new? What what what's popping? What is anything to plug? I got. To, I'm, I'm working on a bunch of music, but none of it, like yeah, none of it's out yet. So just go to look up Wax on Spotify, and I got it. And Herbal Tea is on Wax is on Spotify. Herbal Tea is on Spotify, and Wax and Herbal Tea is on Spotify. Plus, there's songs that are Wax and Herbal Tea. That's not our Wax and Herbal Tea. That's our Wax. newer songs. Yeah. Actually, I would I would say if you want to check something out, go check out Modelo Cans and go get it, which is our two newest Wax and Herbal Tea singles. Okay, so the two newest songs are Modelo Cans and Go Get It. Go go get it. So go get go get it and go get Modelo Cans and watch the fucking video because it's fucking amazing. I'll toss a little clip in here too. Sweet. Love you guys. Thank you. Thank you for having us. We love you too. Neil. Love you. Thank Neil. you so Th- much, man. And uh, I'm glad y'all are still close and, and rocking and living in San Diego and, and making shit. And 
Yeah, I could talk for days. I could talk for days. We'll get on again soon, man. Yeah, whenever, man. It, it, it don't matter. But it's just nice because when the pandemic hit, and I say this on my podcast, doing this shit, it actually feels like hanging out with human beings. My girlfriend right. is in Philadelphia with her brother right now. She's on vacation, so I'm all alone. And I, I feel like I had some human contact, even though it's all digital screens. So thank you for hanging out with me on a, what day is it? Tuesday? Thank you for your Tuesday, human contact. Man. Thanks for ha- hanging out with me on a Tuesday night, guys. I appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you on the flip. All right, young Neil. Take Be care, good. Neil. Be good, guys. Talk soon. Hey, do you like this video? Do you want to see more stuff like it? Well, consider being a patron of my Patreon page, patreon.com backslash Neil P. Neil P. If you pledge monthly, you get some perks, you get some exclusive content, and you get to help stuff like this get made on the monthly. Yo, check it out.